Who's going to be the next president of the United States? Is it going to rain tomorrow? To answer any of these, we need to make a prediction about the future. And we could do that with the help of simulations. I'm Jeff Gallick, and in this episode of Data Demystified, I'm going to walk you through the intuition of how simulations can help us predict future events. If you stick around, you'll learn how simulations help us predict things like the weather, and a whole lot more importantly, who's going to be president next year. When talking about uncertain future events, we tend to use probabilities to describe how likely different outcomes are. We might say that there's a 40% chance that it'll rain tomorrow, or that there's a 70% chance that Biden will win the upcoming presidential election. But if you think about it, those are really strange statements to make. We're talking about single events that will or won't happen. There's no such thing as raining 40%. It's either going to rain or it's not. There's no such thing as winning an election 70%. Either Biden wins or he doesn't. We can use percentages to describe other types of outcomes, ones that repeat. For instance, I could say that if I flip a fair coin a thousand times, I expect about 50% of those flips to be heads. All I'm saying there is that I think about 500 flips out of a thousand will be heads. That's very different from a case of predicting tomorrow's weather, because there's only one tomorrow. We don't get the luxury of repeating tomorrow a thousand times and seeing how often it rains. Instead, when we say that there's a 40% chance of rain, what we really mean is that if we could have a thousand tomorrows, in 40% of them, we would expect rain. But that's a really weird and unintuitive way to think about predictions. So let's take a big step back and see what we mean when we talk about percentage likelihoods for single, non-repeating events. Before we get into that, if you like what you see, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that I put out. With that said, let's work on the intuition for simulations. If saying that there's a 40% chance that it'll rain tomorrow is like saying that if there were a thousand tomorrows, it would rain in 40% of them, how do we know that? Well, this is where simulations come in. When we try to predict the future, instead of imagining that there are a thousand tomorrows, we simulate them. We look to see what inputs might affect tomorrow's outcome, and then see how changing these inputs changes what happens tomorrow. Let's make this really clear with a very simple weather model. Let's pretend that the only things that can possibly determine if it's going to rain tomorrow are the air temperature and the wind speed. Yes, I know that this is nowhere near what it really takes to predict the weather, but we're building what's called a toy model so we can better understand how simulations work. I promise to explain the real complexity in a second. Anyway, let's make this even simpler by saying that air temperature can only be one of three things, cool, tempered, and hot, and wind speed can only be calm or windy. What we can then do is look back in time and see under what temperature and wind conditions it rained. For our toy model, we'll say that in all of history, it only rained when it was both windy and at least tempered outside. But how likely is it to be windy or any particular temperature? Well, again, we can look back and see how often it was ever cool, tempered, or hot, and how often it was ever calm or windy. Again, just to keep things simple, I'm going to pretend that in all of history that it was cool 50% of the time, tempered 40% of the time, and hot only 10% of the time. I'm also going to pretend that we had calm winds 60% of the time and stronger winds 40% of the time. Again, this is all meant to be very simple to demonstrate how simulations work. In reality, we actually go to the weather records and extract this information for each location we're trying to predict the weather for. By the way, if you'd like to play around with some of these numbers, I've built a very simple interactive simulation that I'll link to below. I also have a very short video walkthrough of this simulation that I'll link to as well to help you navigate it and learn how it works. Anyway, now we have everything we need for our simulation. What I do next is pretend that it's tomorrow and see if it will rain. To help with that, in this simple example, I can draw two lines, one for temperature and one for wind, and divide them up based on the likelihood of each possibility of temperature and wind speed based on those historic temperature and wind values that we mentioned earlier. I then pick a random number between 0 and 100 for each of those lines and see where we wind up. In this first simulation, I predict that tomorrow will be cool and windy, and we know from before that means it won't rain. But that's just one simulation, and it's unlikely that just one simulation is enough to make a good prediction about tomorrow, so I try again. This time my random numbers predict that it will be hot and windy, so now I predict it will rain tomorrow. But again, two simulations really isn't enough, so I do this a lot. In this example, I'm going to simulate tomorrow's weather a thousand times, and then count how many times out of the thousand simulations we predicted rain. Here I find that my thousand simulations of tomorrow, it rained 22% of the time. That means that my prediction for rain tomorrow is 22%. Remember that tomorrow it is or it isn't going to rain. There's no such thing as 22% raining. Instead, what I mean by a forecast of 22% rain likelihood is that in my simulations of the future, in 22% of them, it rained. Now, like I said, this was a very oversimplified view of how we predict weather. In fact, it was so simple that you don't actually need simulations. You could have just computed the probability of rain based on the likelihood of what the temperature would be and wind speed would be. Working it out, you'd predict a 20% chance of rain if you did that, which is really close to what our simulation set. The challenge, however, is that real weather forecasting involves a lot more variables than just the two that we have here. Real models will include things like weather in neighboring areas, humidity, barometric pressure, time of year, time of day, and so on. 
It also involves much more than just two or three levels of each of those variables, interactions between those variables, and far less certainty about the probabilities of each of the underlying weather conditions. That makes doing a simple calculation like you could in our toy model a whole lot more difficult. So yes, in our toy model, we don't need simulations because we could just do the math. But in reality, when predicting complex events like tomorrow's weather, simulations are one of our most powerful tools. To really build your intuition for how simulations work, let's look at one more example of how simulations might work to predict election outcomes. This is an image from one of my favorite political sites, 538, as of September 2nd, 2020, when I filmed this video. What it's showing here is that they predict a 69% chance of Biden winning the election. Importantly, this isn't a prediction of how many votes Biden will get or how big his margin of victory will be, but it's rather a prediction of whether he will win or not. But remember, there's no such thing as a 69% win. Biden will win or he won't. So where does this number come from? If you look a bit more carefully, you'll find that this prediction comes from 40,000 simulations of what might happen in an election given what we know about how voters will vote. Just like with our weather forecast, the folks at 538 put together a list of all the possible things that could happen in November and then see what outcomes emerge. In this case, those things are the vote shares in each state. Because we use the electoral college system in the United States for electing our president, what matters most in determining who will win is how each state will cast its electoral votes. And to figure that out, we turn to political polls, a topic I've covered in another video that I'll link to below. Let's take a closer look at a few states and see how this would work. Based on polling data, it seems all but certain that Trump will win the state of Wyoming. The best estimate as of this video is that he will win about 68% of the vote in that state, so his margin is huge, and so in our simulation, we'd say something like Trump is 99% likely to win Wyoming. By the way, it's not 100% because there's still a tiny chance that something crazy will happen between now and November that would cost Trump the state. On the other end of the aisle, Biden's almost sure to win Massachusetts since he's currently polling at about 65%, all but assuring he'll win the state, and we assign him a 99% chance of winning all of Massachusetts electors. Where things get a bit messier are places like Arizona. Here, Biden, with 50% of the vote share, just barely leads Trump with 49% of the vote share. So in our simulation, in the simplest form, we say that it's a coin flip who wins Arizona. We do this type of analysis for all 50 states in the District of Columbia, and then just like with our weather forecast, we draw a line for each state, cutting it up based on how polls are predicting the vote share, run our simulation, and see who gets enough electoral votes to win the election. Except that we don't do this just once. We do that a lot. 538 does this 40,000 times, and of those 40,000 simulations, 69% of them came back with Biden winning. That's where forecasts come from. To be super clear, that doesn't mean Biden is assured to win. In fact, 31% of the simulations predict that Trump will win. But what it does tell us is that as of this recording, if we had the luxury of running 40,000 elections, we expect that Biden would win more of them than Trump would. Like with weather simulations, I also put together a very simple election forecast that lets you plug in values for how likely each candidate is to win each state to see how that influences the simulations. I'll link to that below and put together a short tutorial to explain how it works. The last thing we might want to consider is to see just how good our simulations are at predicting the future. The way we do that is by comparing how well they did in the past to what actually happened. With weather, that's actually relatively easy to do by comparing, say, how often it rained relative to how often the forecast said it would rain. Except that we don't want to treat all forecasts of rain the same way. There's a big difference between a forecast of 20% chance and 90% chance of rain. So what we do is look to see how often it rained for every level of prediction from 0 to 100%. In other words, when the weather forecast says it's 30% likely to rain, how often did it actually rain? If our simulation is a good one, we should find that when it made a forecast of 30%, it should have actually rained about 30% of the time. Just like if the simulation predicted it would rain 80% of the time, we should be able to look back and see that it actually rained 80% of those days. With weather forecasts, we can actually do this easily. Here's a plot that CNBC put out looking at different weather predictions. The black line in the middle is what we would expect if predictions were absolutely perfect. When the prediction was 50% chance of rain, it actually rained 50% of the time. What you can see here, though, is that most weather services seem to underpredict rain. For example, whenever AccuWeather said that rain was 30% likely, it actually rained about 42% of the time. Or whenever the Weather Channel said that rain was 70% likely, it actually rained about 86% of the time. However, overall the predictions weren't too bad. The more that these outlets predicted rain, the more it actually rained. They didn't make those predictions perfectly, but to be fair, weather is not an easy thing to predict. With presidential elections, this kind of comparison is much more difficult because we just have a lot less data to look back to. High quality political polling and simulations like these haven't been around for long, and so we don't have a good way to check if they were right. In fact, people often point to the 2016 presidential forecast from 538 as being wrong when it predicted that Hillary Clinton had a 71.4% chance of winning the election. But remember what the forecast actually means. It's not that Clinton was assured of victory. It's that in the many simulations that they ran, Trump only won about 29% of them. 538 didn't predict a Clinton win. Rather, they predicted that if we had 1,000 elections, Trump would win 29% of them. Well, we didn't get to have 1,000 elections. We just had one. 
And that one happened to be one of those 29% where Trump wins. Was Trump less likely to win than Hillary? Sure. But this prediction isn't saying that Trump was certain to lose, just that there were fewer simulations where he won. So are political forecasts using simulations worthless if we can't validate them like we do with the weather? Not at all. Presidential elections are few and far between, but we do have other elections to look at. Here's a plot of accuracy of 538's predictions of US House of Representative elections. Just like with our weather graph, what we see with these small blue dots is that the higher the prediction, the more likely the event actually happened. In other words, when 538 predicted a candidate for the House of Representatives had a 10% chance of winning, those candidates won about 10% of the time. They were serious underdogs going into the race, but they still won, just not very often. If the presidential forecasts are as good as the congressional ones, we should have confidence that they are actually pretty accurate. The point of all this is to show you that this is a recipe for how you should be thinking about forecasts of single future events like elections, weather, sports, or anything else really. We can use simulations to pretend that the future event doesn't just happen once, but rather happens many times. By doing so, we can better understand how likely any outcome is to actually occur. Finally, if you found this interesting, please take a moment to like the video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon to get notified when new content comes out. Also, if there are other topics in the world that involve data and you want to get a better intuitive understanding of them, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to create content meant just for you, my viewers.